Welcome back to another episode here at A View From The Bullins. I am, of course, The Bobble, and joining me is Paul Draper and Steve Kelly for this one. Guys, we've had a lot of, well, a couple of days now to think about the, the result against Newcastle. A 0-0 draw at Goodison Park. Everton get a point as we head into the into international break. Steve, the major talking point is, you know, is still the, the Dominic Calvert-Lewin penalty call. Um, you know, it was deemed a no penalty by the referee and by VAR on the day. You know, Dan Byrne gets in front of Dominic Calvert-Lewin. Does Dominic Calvert-Lewin kick Dan Byrne? Mm. Does Byrne impede... Dominic, it's what are your thoughts in it, on it? I know you've looked at it a few times now, and again, it's really, really dividing opinion on social media, isn't it? What is your opinion on it, mate? Yeah, a, a few, a few days on. I still, I still, I'm still unsure whether it is or not. Um, I, I totally get from the referee's point of view that if he'd give it, I don't think they probably would have overturned it. But also, I can also see his point of view. He's kicked the back of Dan Burns' leg. Dan, like I've seen this morning, Dan Byrne is very clever the way he puts his foot across. I think the argument was there was one a couple of weeks ago with, um, was it, I think it might have been Calvin Phillips involved in it where he's put his foot across and he's done exactly the same thing. It was the, I think it was the Anthony Gordon one, sorry, last season with um, with with Calvin Phillips. But yeah, I'm, I'm still unsure. It's, it's, I think in real time it looked a penalty, but then when you've looked at that, the, the replay over again, he, he does kick the back of his foot. Yeah, I, I really don't know. I really don't know. I think it's... Uh, is, is Dan Byrne entitled to put his leg where he put it? I think you're entitled to put your body across, yes, I do, as a defender's point of view, mm. because that's what you're taught to, as a defender to be clever. You're taught to bring your body across and, and not impede him, but play, play, play for, play, play Make for it. Make life difficult. Yeah, exactly. So I think... <laughs> I'm probably going to get a lot of stick for this now, but I actually think it, it might be the right, de- probably the right decision. <coughs> but like I also said then, <laughs> I think if he goes to VAR, they don't change the mind if it's given. So mm. I, I think it's a 50-50 call. It, it, it is a really 50-50 call. I've seen people say it's definitely not a penalty. You've seen media pundits say it's definitely not a penalty. I've seen media pundits say it was a penalty. So I think that just says it all, really. If the referee's not 100% sure and they're not 100% sure it's a penalty, I suppose they have actually come up with the right decision. That's what we want, don't we? We don't want referees guessing or going with gut instincts. We want them to get the right decision. So probably get a lot of stick for it. But look, if I was, if I was the referee, I'd probably say it was no penalty. Well, Paul, you think it probably was a penalty? <sighs> it's, it's just one of them. I think it's a, it's a grey area. Yeah. If it gets given, it doesn't get overturned. But you think it should have probably been given? Um. Not that I think it maybe should have been given. I'm shocked the referee didn't maybe give in to the pressure or give it because when you face it, it just looks yeah. stonewall. And I'm not saying it is. For me, it's not a stonewall penalty. But when you're, when you're watching it live, when you're watching at the ground, it looks so clear that it's a penalty. I think even on the commentary, when you're watching it back, Carragher goes straight away, yeah. penalty, penalty. Yeah. And even in the first replay, he still thinks it's a penalty. So I was more shocked that the referee didn't maybe... Given because he was having a bit of a, a bit of a tough game. I thought Craig Porson, especially first half, and you could see the crowd were really on top of the referee. And I'm I'm just surprised he never, he never gave the penalty initially. But when you watch it back, I think Sean Dyche alluded in his press conference, and I think it was the perfect explanation. If that's in, if that's anywhere else on the pitch, Everton probably get a free kick from it. Yeah, I think there is a higher threshold in penalty boxes for penalties. Yeah, I, I think that, that's yeah. a given nowadays. There is a high. There should, I think, there probably should be a slightly higher threshold. And it's similar to the one that um, that Dominic Carver Lewin had. I think it was with Lewis Dunk first game of the season. Yeah, mm. it's quite similar. Where Dunk, where Dom's still on Dunk, and he's uh, basically slid, uh, slip, sorry, and and it, and the referees initially gave a penalty, and then it's been overturned. I think this one's a bit more, not a a, a bit more of a fifty-fifty. Again, Dan Byrne is entitled to put his to put his body across to kind of to protect the ball, but in my opinion, and he's not trying to make any contact with the ball. He's trying to impede Dominic from getting a shot away, and for me, that could be a foul. <clears throat> I'm I'm not saying it's a stonewall penalty. I don't think it's clear yeah. and obvious. As I say, if they got given, I don't think it'd be overturned. And as it wasn't given on on field on field, it wasn't overturned. What I will say, don't. It is a guy and a guy has got to score that 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 rebound. Yeah, like we, we wouldn't be discussing this if if that gets put in with open goal, seven eight yards out. Mm. It's 
it's a massive miss. Mm, and probably the only player who didn't want it to fall to on the whole team, it fell to. But yeah, I think the the penalty is a bit of a bit of a tricky one. Well, I spoke to two current professional referees, and they have both deemed it a no penalty. See, the, the the crazy thing is, I actually thought the one at home to Brighton was more of a penalty. The one mm. Dominic had because only because Lewis Dunk's gone to ground. He's gone to ground. That's why I know Dominic stands on his foot, but Lewis Dunk, as I'm, like I was amazed that I, that got overturned the first, and it's like yesterday. I think if it's given, I don't, I don't, I think they they stick with the original decision with the referee. I think it'd be classed as a penalty, but I think I don't think either way it's clear and obvious. No, it's not, and I think if the good thing, Dan Byrne has impeded him, but that's what you're taught to do as a defender. You're taught to use every art in the book. It's like the one where. If the cross comes in and the defender bends down and the the player goes over you, it's it's what they're taught to do now. It's it from a defender's point of view. Well, from a defender's point of view, he's done the right thing. Yeah, from a defender's point of view, if that's Tarkowski with the other end, yeah, he needs to try and do something. Yeah. He can't let Anthony Gordon have a free shot. That's what I'd be saying. He needs to try and get his body in front of him or prevent him or you know obviously by not fouling obviously but making his life difficult. Now I'm obviously I'm rewatching the replay again and this this must be for the forty fiftieth time. Dan Byrne puts his leg in front of Dominic Calvert-Lewin as Dominic Calvert-Lewin's got his leg to, back to shoot. Now, is that is that a foul by doing that? It's it's one of them where it's a grey area, and I've spoken to my former coach, and he deemed it a no penalty as well. Yeah, he said he said it's not enough. He said that's not a pen. He said a defender is perfectly within their right to do that. I think it's a lot of it though. I think. A, I think fans' frustration, a lot of it's just the inconsistency. I think it is, yeah. And I, I think if they if they're not given every week, it's like I think we seen one at the weekend where um, Mark Gay was pulled back by Virgil Van Dijk in the Liverpool Palace game. And that was not given, and it was a clear penalty. There was a one a couple of weeks ago, exactly the same, which was given. So that's it's the inconsistencies which fans find frustrating. I think if that penalty is not given, or, or most weeks. Fans could probably live with it a bit more. I think probably wouldn't be talking about because we'd know that referees don't give those type of penalties. But I think because there's so much inconsistency in the game with fouls in the boxes, handballs in the boxes, it's still going on now for three, four years nearly. Now I still don't think we've mastered VAR in this country. No, we haven't. I still think we are we are not great at using it. Um, I also think the quality of refereeing isn't great at the moment as well, which, you know... Hasn't been, been great for a while. No, it hasn't been good for at least, I'd say, a good three, four years now. Um, and I think that's probably frustration. I don't know, I'm just speaking from my opinion, that's what I find frustrating in the game from referees and, and decisions point of view is that there's just so much inconsistency from one referee to the other. And and obviously Craig Pawson has had the, the greatest of times against Everton as well. That's another... That's another thing that fans will look at and, 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 and look at his performances against Everton in the past as well. Um, so Because obviously he was in the Merseyside derby last year when he should have sent uh, Ibrahim Kanate off. Fans do look at, we all know, we we, we we know what referees are like. We we hear certain referees re reffing our game and we're all like, oh, not him again. So that also doesn't help us think who was refereeing the game on Saturday. Um, so, but... Yeah, I, I can I can see both sides of it. I can I can honestly see why people think it is and it isn't. So, yeah, me. So that's probably the they've probably done the right thing, not giving it. Then if that's what everybody thinks. But I think if it was given, it wouldn't be overturned. I agree. Do you yeah. agree with that, Paul? I agree. I don't think it'll be overturned. The referees in this country are too scared to VAR referees in this country are too scared to go against the mates. I think Mike Dean said it. I think it yeah. was a Chelsea Tottenham. He said. He was too scared to send that. And he tailored the screen. He said to him, "You're my mate. I didn't want to send you there because you had a bit of a difficult game. It's, it's, it's what you're up against. Not just Everton. This is not just the Everton thing. This is the whole Premier League. It's what you're up against against referees. It's probably the lowest standard of referee in English football has seen in in a number, number, number of years. And I think that's why you you, you see this. That's the reason." That's sorry. That's what comes with the struggles of getting young yeah. people to Ref. to get into the refereeing world. I think you just being pieces on it that there's not as many referees as there used to be, and I think one because it's harder to get into into the big leagues due to politics yeah, stuff yeah. like that. 
and because the standard of it right now, the standard is, is atrocious. Do you think? Do, do you think he, he should have just went and had a look anyway? Just, just to, like I know Sean Dyche mentioned it after the game. He went, just go and have a look. And if, it's, but and if, if you, you go and have a look, then what is the expect? So it's all about expectations. That that's that's like the rule of thumb. Yeah. What is the expectation in the UK or in England, say, when a referee goes to look at the screen? The expectation is the decision is given, yeah. isn't it? So you give a penalty. So that then adds more more fuel to the fire if he goes to the screen and then doesn't give it because the expectation is he's given it. So we'll talk about the penalty in the first half from James Tarkowski who rags down Sandro Tonali. The minute Pawson signals the, the VAR screen, I'm going over to the VAR screen, 99 times out of 100, he's given the penalty. Yeah. So that's the expectation there. So you, you, the rule of thumb is you don't want to ever add more fuel to the fire. That's always the, the thought process. So if you went to the screen, the expectation is you've, it's, it's, you're putting more pressure on, on yourself to then give a penalty or more pressure on VAR to give a penalty. And if VAR haven't instructed you to go to the screen, then don't go to the screen. Do you mm. understand? Yeah, I, I just don't know whether it's... If, I, I get what Daesh means though at times where that this is the issue, isn't it? What we're, what we're saying is that a lot of referees have all different interpretations. Well, they're humans, so everyone has yeah, a, What exactly. I might deem as a foul... No matter how much I'm coached and no matter how much I'm taught and no, no matter how good I am, yeah. what I deem as a, oh, that's a foul. Maybe different to what I from, deem From as another a foul. referee at the same level in the Premier League, may also then think, well, I, I'm not sure. I think that's a bit soft. Mm. You, can't, you can't coach that. That's just then a personal personal thing. Yeah, because I, I, I agree with Jay, but I, at first sight, it was 100 to me. It's more of a pen on it first sight. Oh, it yeah, is. yeah, yeah, 100%. When you've seen it live. You forget about Garner's miss. That's why. Cause you, yeah, I, cause I, didn't, like, I, I didn't even know he missed. I didn't <laughs> yeah. even know he missed till he got Same. home. Because I remember me mate was saying, Garner's got to score that. I mean, yeah. what, what you're on about? <laughs> Hello. What, what do you mean he got to yeah. score that? What, what chance? And until I got, until I did it, and, and not until I got home and I seen it, I didn't know Garner had missed that chance. But I think I was on the, I think I was on the front row of the glass three for that. I got over to like by me mates and pff, as soon as I see us, everyone like the, we were with photographers and that everyone thought penalty yeah, penalty. Same. It's yeah. obvious. Yeah. It looks stonewall. But yeah. when you watch it back, I think we didn't watch it on on the phones and the stands, and we thought mm, it's it's not clear. It grey could area. Be, it's it's grey one of them grey area. Ones. He has kicked him. You can see he kicks him. There's anyone who says that Dominic doesn't kick Dan Bain is just lying. Yeah, let's yeah. be honest. Dominic does kick. Kick Dan Burn. The argument for me, is, Dan Burn the is, argument for me is, yeah. is Dan Burn impeding? Is Dan Burn there to maybe to trip Dom? Is Dan Burn playing the ball? I think Dan That's a Burn completely been different clever. argument. But yeah. it, nev it, ne it never yeah. got given. It never got VAR. As you said, referees don't think that's a penalty. So it's clever defending. Mm. It's yeah. very good defending. Yeah. If it was in another box, would it get given? That's a different story. Well, I was going to reverse it. If that's up at our end and Michael Keane does that to Anthony Gordon, and they give a penalty. Are you fuming? Yes or no? I'm not sure. I'm fuming at the referee. I'm <laughs> yeah. I'm fuming at my defender giving the referee a decision to make. Even if I think it may not be a pen, you, for me, you don't give the, the referee that decision to make. And that's, are you feeling are you feeling feeling unjust if a penalty is given for that against your team? Yes or no? I'm not sure. <laughs> that, I think that's the thing. I think, and I think there's your problem. There's, I think yeah. That's, I think your answer just nailed it on. I, I, we still, we've just spoke for 10 minutes about it and we're, I still don't think any of us are 100% sure whether it's a penalty. Well, I, if, if I <laughs> talking, my, my, my understanding and my my experience, if you're not 100%, you cannot give a penalty. No, That's I agree it because with that. It's a, it's a key match decision. So you get key match decisions. From right? now on, if that gets given against us, I'm fuming. Well, because if it's not going forward, the issue, well, well, I get yeah. well, just, just, to, just to hold you there. So the key match decisions are goals, red cards, penalties, serious foul play. Yeah. They're, they're your key match decisions. So that is a key match decision. And you have to be absolutely categorically certain that that is or isn't on a key match decision. Now, mm. I've rewatched it genuinely probably 40, 50 times ahead of this show. I am not concrete 100% that it's a penalty. No. I, On first glance, you go, that's a pen. First time, that's a pen. And then the game all then comes about angles. And as a referee, you're always taught about angles. Get good angles, get good angles, get good angles, okay? The rule of thumb is you do the figure of eight on a pitch, yeah. okay? So if one, the people that are listening on a video, now you're about to see me, you're doing the figure eight. If you can do the figure of eight on a football pitch, that means you'll always have a good angle, no matter where the ball is, if you understand, Yeah. okay? 
That's what they're trying to teach you as you're coming through the rankings. Do the figure of eight on a pitch and you'll be fine. Some angles make it look, that's a pen. Other angles make it look, no, oh, I'm not sure because Dominic does kick, that, does kick Dan Byrne. But then does Dan Byrne put his leg there by purpose? But he's perfectly entitled to put his leg there. Of course he is. He's trying to defend his goal. Of course he's allowed to do that. And then you start going down all different permutations. And when you start going down that sort of rabbit hole, you then start to think, this isn't clear and obvious. No. It's not clear and obvious. Because there's another angle which shows you Dan Byrne is it touching Carver Loon's ankle. Yes, but that's, that's soft. What, that, yeah. that would be soft. But that's what I mean. That's, I think people are looking at so yes, many different because angles. Because you are slowing it down to the minuscule, aren't you? And then you, when you start doing that, you look for any infringement, any yeah. anything. All oh, he's touched his sleeve. Do you know what I mean? That's what, how it sort of goes. I am not concrete. I'm not. And because of that, people might not like it. Because I'm not concrete, taking off my Everton hat, I'm just a football fan. If you're not 100%, you shouldn't give a penalty. No, you shouldn't. And it's not that's not being corrupt. That is just, if you're not 100%. Now, don't get me wrong, if that happens up the other end and they give it and we don't get one down our end, then, then that's where it then becomes frustrating because that's when then the consistency is lacking. And I think that is a major issue in football is the consistency. Yeah. It is. No, it is. But look, a lot of Evertonians think it was a penalty. And I think, again, I can see why they think it's a penalty. But for me, my personal opinion, I'm not 100% sold. So because of that reason, I, if I was on the VAR, I wouldn't have given it. But however, if he'd have given it, I wouldn't have overturned it because it's not clear and obvious to overturn. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, because cause when, cause I mean, when I seen it, like I said, I was adamant. And then we've got the cameras, the VAR mm. stuff in front of us where we sit. And when you watch it again, you're, like, and you, you, you're adamant and goes for to... Uh, I don't know. I can. See, there's a slight bit of doubt in there. Then yeah. you then go. Yeah. I can see why VAR hasn't given it. It's down to interpretation. Yeah, Correct. It is. Correct. No, you're right. It is. <laughs> yeah. It, it's a great. That, this is one of those. This is one of those ones that is a grey area. It yeah. really, really is. And there's no. Sometimes there is no right or wrong as a referee. There isn't. You have to just go on your instincts and then VAR. But again, if I'm on VAR and Porson didn't give it, I'm being brutally honest. I am not overturning his decision. I'm not. Because I'm going. Yeah. I'm not 100 percent certain either. And because of that reason, I'm not. I'm not asking yeah. uh, to, for him to go to look at the monitor and give it. However, if he gave it, I would go, yeah, I'm not going to overturn it. I'll go with the on-field decision. And that's not me being a cop-out. That is me acknowledging it is a, a decision that can, sometimes can go either way. And that mm. sometimes is football. Sometimes football isn't as black and white as people would like it to be. Sometimes it's not. Um, moving on, the, the, the first penalty in the first half, Tarkovsky drags down Sandro Tonali. Stupid. I think we can all agree it was... Paul, it was absolutely stupid. Again, you give, your, the, you give the referee or the VAR a decision to make, it's it's criminal. Um, it's a blatant penalty, stonewall. Um, I think it's like the gay one. That's I think that's where I've seen Palace fans aggrieved that the Newcastle one gets given and they don't get one against Liverpool. But yeah, I think we can all agree. Very, very childish and experienced from, from James Tarkowski. Penalty, but... Looking back, it was all worth it. Mm. It was all worth it. What was what was this? Just before we talk about Anthony Gordon's miss, what was James Car James Tarkowski thinking, Steve? I mean, he had the, he had the audacity, and I'm a big fan, but he had the audacity to to complain and and plead his innocence. It's it's absolutely stonewall, isn't it? Yeah, I think it I think it summed up his first half display. Mm -hmm. If I'm honest, um, I thought he was very very poor first half, especially. I thought second half he was a lot better, um, but. He got, he got caught out actually a few times in the first half. He, he let Joe Linton uh, the ball go over his head, and Joe Linton nearly getting off it as well. But it's just silly. From I know we spoke over the last couple of weeks about your experienced players starting to get to grips with the games and stuff like that. But I just thought it was just very very poor from Tarkovsky. And I think um, yeah, I, I think I think it sums up a bit of James Tarkovsky's season at the moment. I don't think it's been great, um, and I think. Doing that in such a key game um, was was really really poor. But I know, obviously, like Paul said, it was uh, it was great to see Gordon miss the penalty. But from my side, I was more I was a bit more angry with James Tarkovsky and why he had to do that. The ball had kind of gone over as well, so it, he didn't need to do it. Um, I thought it just showed a lack of um, lack of maturity for such an experienced player, really. And that's the most disappointing thing from Tarkovsky's point of view because. We do class him as one of our leaders and he did let us down on Saturday with that decision that he made to throw someone on the ground for no reason at all. Where, let's be honest, we've just been talking about VAR there for the last 10, 15 minutes. You can't get away with it no more. 
you just can't get away with it. I'm, I'm amazed. I'll be honest with you, I'm amazed the referee didn't see it straight away because it was that. But he, he basically picks him. Referee's up from, looking at Murphy though taking the he? shots. Isn't yeah, he? but mm. I just think it. I just think it's just incre- incredibly poor from from Targovsky, and it's something um, it could have cost us. But thankfully, uh, Pickford got us out. Got us out of the uh, the mess that he put us in. Mm. Yeah, I was disappointed with it by Targovsky. I, I, he's he's got to be more experienced and more clever than that, Paul. Surely. Yeah, it's. As I said before, it's so inexperienced from from such, from a player with such great experience in the Premier League, so one that we've been able to rely on for the last two, three seasons. And it's just one of them where his head's gone, he's wrestled to Nali to the ground. VAR's caught seeing it and a penalty's been given and he's got no arguments whatsoever against the penalty. It's it's as clear as you'll get. But yeah, just hopefully that can get that can get eradicated because we do we have tend to give a lot of stupid penalties away yeah. under uh, over the last few years and uh, that's something that we need to kind of stop doing. Mm. This, this is going to sound really disrespectful now, but gonna, I think it was so, it would be something that James Tarkovsky would have done when he was at Burnley because that's what type of t- team they were under Dice. They were like the bit of a bit of a bit yard doggy mm. type type defenders where throwing people around and stuff like that. like. You, you, <laughs> I just don't think as a, as a Premier League centre back in such a, a big environment like Everton, fans went for for that type of stuff. Fans were not happy with it. Too his, cheap. It is, yeah, and and like it's just it's just an easy penalty to give away. It's just a stupid penalty to give away. So I'm hoping that obviously Dice will have a word over that because it's something um, I did. I did. I actually did think it affected his whole first half performance as well. Not just that moment. There was a moment, like I said, with Joe Linton where he, where he nearly nearly cost us a goal as well. And I think his head, his head. If you look at last week as well, he he was lucky to get away with one Against last Crystal week. Crystal Palace, yeah. And then he dives into a tackle straight after that one last week as well. He tackles Mateta, yeah. which is probably a penalty, really. Yeah. And then he goes in at Eze as well. So it's rash from him. And mm, both he, tackles are rash. Yeah, and he, he's got to he's got to get that out of his. He's definitely got to get out of his game or mm. keep costing us. I think it's just. Unfortunately for Tarkovsky, he started the season quite quite poorly. Yeah, uh, sluggish. Yeah. In all honesty, it's just... So he, he, he's missed, he missed quite a bit of pre-season, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, as, as, as we said the other week, the players like him, Jordan, Garner, who missed pre-season, Mikhailenko, they're just about getting up to full fitness and kind mm. of level with the rest of the team right now. And I think, again, to go back to the inconsistency, the argument that even if Tarkovsky got the argument of, oh, but if that's that's happened to me on the other side, on the on the other on the other box, and it, and it hasn't been given in a different game, or Gay hasn't got one earlier in the earlier in the day for for Crystal Palace, mm. that doesn't matter. The inconsistency doesn't matter because, as I said before, you give the referee and the VAR a decision to make. You basically make it easy for them. Agree, yeah. And it was, it was just poor from James Sarkowski, really, really poor. Mm. But luckily. We've got a really, really, really good goalkeeper that kept us in it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, huge save. Uh, moving on, were you pair disappointed that Sean Dyche didn't go in and try and win the game? I mean, I've seen on social media a few times and, and it has been spoken about on, on publications that, you know, Everton were happy with the point and were settling for the point, whereas Eddie Howe was trying to force the issue. He was trying to obviously get the victory. Now, don't get me wrong, I think we can all agree. Newcastle are, are above Everton in terms of, of, of quality right now. They're a better team than Everton. There's no hiding from that. But were you disappointed that Everton didn't go and try and find the winner? Or were you thinking, you know what, I think we were quite lucky to get out there with with a point, really? Oh, before the game, I would have, I would have took a point, 100%, because Newcastle are a good side. There's some really good players in the team. But when I'm at home, I always want to go and win the game. I think it's just something I've been brought up on, Everton winning home games. And it doesn't matter who it's against at times. But I did think, we, I, I did think probably second half, second half especially, we were quite negative. In uh, in our play, I think the stats say that as well. That Newcastle had plenty of the ball. I think their xG was quite high compared to Everton's xG in the game as well. Uh, I know obviously Everton had the big chance near the end with Dominic, um, but I, I do. I know people say the possession side doesn't matter, but I actually do think it does matter. I, I really do because I just think the Premier League is just completely different now. I think. Ten years ago, you can you can get away with playing with 30 40 percent possession, but I think the quality of player now in the league and the way teams play, the pace they play at, I do think we do set up at times a bit lower leagueish. Well, what I will say is that when you don't have the ball, you have to work a lot harder, and then when you do get the ball, 
Because you've been chasing shadows for maybe five, six minutes. Or you're not going to the pitch. You're then harder to get up 30 yeah. yards. You're not only that, you're probably a little bit more drained than you would be or you should be. Then you make a little bit of a lazy pass. You don't make the right play. Yeah. So, yeah, of course it changes things. I do I do think, and you're right exactly exactly with that. With I think our quality in the final third is really poor well, because of that as well. Um, but, like I said, they're a very good team. We spoke on the, on the match preview about their midfield. I thought their midfield was really good on Saturday for... Gramerez and and Joe Linton were, were very good, especially for uh, especially for Newcastle. But yeah, I would like Everton to always try and win, win the game. But I also do understand from Sean Dyche's point of view, he's in a, he's in a, he's in a results based business, and getting a point at home to Newcastle isn't a bad result for him. Um, but I think we do have to we do have to improve the way we are keeping the ball because I think we are giving the ball away too cheap, especially in the final third, and also. In the midfield, again, it's something we spoke about. The midfield probably quality-wise isn't the best technically. If you look at the players in there, that's yeah. why we spoke about James Garner. His preferred position would be as a deep-line playmaker, not as a right-back, but that doesn't suit the way Sean Dyche wants to play. And um, Like I said, I think we just have to... I think I said the other day, I think as a fan base this season, it's not going to be pretty to watch. And I think... Sean Dyche will be just looking to get Everton safe as quick as possible. So then, and then what happens after that happens? But I do think we, I do think, um, I do think we do need to to improve in that midfield area, especially of keeping the ball because I think we're just giving it away way too cheaply. What about you, Paul? Were you disappointed that Everton maybe didn't go and try and find a winner, or were you of the opinion of you know what we've probably rode our luck a little bit? They've missed some big chances. They've also missed a penalty. We we make sure we grab a point here. I think towards the last 20, Everton could have maybe pushed for a winner. Um, obviously, we had that chance around 67 minutes with Dominic, which then led, obviously, to Idrissa Gay skying the rebound and, obviously, the, the penalty incident. But apart from that, second half was easy for Newcastle's defence. You think, mate, in front of the Gladys Street, go for the game a bit, take it to Newcastle. They, they were running out of ideas, I felt. I think, for me, their best player was, was Bruno Gimaraes and... Yeah. Well, and Tenali, I thought Sandro Tenali had an outstanding 60, 70 minutes, however long he was on the pitch. And when he went off, I felt that Newcastle didn't really have much to throw us after that. They took off um, Harvey Barnes, Almiron came on, uh, Joe Willer came on on the left, then he put Joe Linton on the left. Then that was changing around. They couldn't really get many opportunities Newcastle second half apart from that 1v1 that Gordon had later on in the game I think the reason why Dice didn't go for it is he didn't trust the people on the bench he doesn't trust Beto clearly he's he's mm. stopped doing making that sub of Dominic off for Beto that he used to do every game he's stopped that and I'm I'm glad he's done that I, I only want the sub to happen if you if think that be. if that's going to impact the game whereas for example Bournemouth I think he made that sub, it didn't impact yeah. the game. Dominic was having an excellent game and got took off. And Lindstrom, after last week, he just doesn't trust him. And I think that, that that's a fair that's a fair assessment. You saw he brought a midfielder on before, bringing a winger on when he took Jack Harrison off. I thought Dwight and Njai were tiring towards the end. And I thought maybe a bit of pace would have helped. But it, the shape was there, the... The commitment was there and the game plan for Sean Dyche was working. So I can understand why he never made changes. I'd have liked yeah. us to go for, for the game a little bit more towards the end. Maybe try and try and box Newcastle in a bit more. Try and keep them try and pin them back a bit. Try and keep their full backs back. Obviously, Lewis Hall and then Tino Livermento came on late on. Try and keep them further back a bit. But yeah, what I was disappointed was NJ getting switching over to the right too late for me. I think he wasn't having the best of games against Kane and Trippi, but when he went up against Lewis Hall for the last five, ten minutes, mm. the few times, two or three times he got the ball, he was getting past him relatively easy. Mm. He, with the skill and kind of his and kind of the power he's got, he's so hard to knock off the ball. And I, I think that's something I was disappointed in that we didn't switch our wingers maybe a bit a bit earlier. And I, and I know the the numbers are backing him up, but I just don't. I think the balance of the team. Isn't right with McNeil in the ten. Well, I, well, I, I, I just we're going to go on to this now. So let's just start the conversation. 
I am still not happy with the structure of the team. I think no. teams bypass our midfield far too easy. That's central area, Paul. And I think we saw a few times big gaps. Not only that, you saw odd man rushes where it was five on four in their favour in the first half and in the second half. And you're thinking, why, why, how yeah. they got through our midfield so easy? And that's not a personnel issue. It's, a lot of it is a structure issue. Yes, you can change McNeil and put someone else, but a lot of it is built on a structure. And the structure isn't balanced. And I still don't think it's been And rectified. I think, sorry, Steve, first mm. half I thought Dwight was too deep. Yeah. Also, so then if we were sending a ball up to Dom and he's winning the header or he's bringing it down, there's, yeah. there's no yeah. one there's no yeah. one around him. Yeah. I think Dwight's had the job of trying not not let Bruno and Tanali get on the ball, but they were still getting on the ball relatively easy. They, they were, especially first half, I thought Bruno Gimenez was excellent. He's a... He's he's a top 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 class midfielder, and I don't think he'll be he'll be there for much longer. Although he does really seem to love life yeah. at Newcastle, but you can imagine the best teams in the world coming in for him at some point because he is he is an unbelievable midfielder. But I th- and I think Dwight had a kind of a job to try and mama whoever was lying deeper between him and and Tenali. It wasn't working. Then he couldn't get further forward. And uh, when we were getting the ball, we weren't really doing much. We didn't have a single. I don't think we had a single corner all game. No, no, ten, to, ten to ten yeah. to zero. All yeah, game. so I just didn't. I didn't really like the balance of of the midfield three, if you want to class it like that, or kind of the midfield five with with the wingers. Uh, I just I think that's something that that is really struggling to get to get a grip of that that structure there. What I will say is, were you guys happy with the with the defensive structure from set pieces? Ten corners, obviously no goals conceded. A, you know, big big clean sheet. I thought defensively, Steve, from set pieces especially, I thought we looked a lot better. Bar one moment in the first half, yeah. very very early on, where, Bar we the were, first corner. where we looked a bit yeah we looked a bit dodgy. But from that point on, I thought we dealt with their set pieces very very well. And they're a big team, Newcastle. They've got some big lads, mm-hmm. you know, Joe Linton, Dan Byrne, Fabian Shah. They've got some big boys in that team. But I thought defensively, mate, I thought it was probably the best performance of the season from set pieces. Yeah, I actually thought Dominic played his part in that as well. Uh, on corners, he with was some like, big headers, really big, especially second half. And um, special mention as well to Michael Keane, who I thought was excellent again. And uh, he's had his he had as his critics. Um, in the last, let's be honest, in the last 18 months, especially as an Everton player, but I actually thought he, him and Ashley Young were Everton's two best players on Saturday. And, and again, everyone's got different opinions on that, but I actually thought both of them were outstanding. I thought Ashley Young, if I'm honest, has probably been one of Everton's better players this season, um, bar the Brighton game, which he got sent off in. Um, I thought, like you said, yeah, definitely. I think bar that one in the first half, I was never really worried because I think I think you can tell with Everton when they're on it defensively, especially from set pieces, that I think that one in the first half was a bit of a let off and it didn't happen again. And I think fair play to like I said, the, the back four and obviously Dominic coming back for the uh, for the corners as well. But I think I think both of you are right about the structure side of it of the team. I just don't I actually still don't think he knows his best team. I really don't. And um I just it was it was incredibly poor how Newcastle could go from the edge of their box to the edge of our box so quickly with just one ball. It happened it happened in the second half many times as well. Grimera's just playing easy balls into Joe Linton. No one's marking him. I actually think the structure got better when he went to Decore back in the back in a free rather than Dwight McNeil. Um and again it proves the point that <laughs> Everton don't lose games when Decore's in the side again. It's I know we can go back to this all the time, but it it, it it's a fact and Dwight McNeil, yeah, obviously his goals the last couple of weeks, his assists have been great, but um, I would like to see Dice rotate the front three a lot more. So McNeil, Harrison and in, in Njai. I do think they're quite in, in, interchangeable. They, they are as well, because it, it was something that David Moyes used to do quite a lot. I was an Everton manager with PNR, Arteta, rotate them around the pitch. Leon Osman plays like that. It, it is it is doable, and you see other clubs doing exactly the same. Look at, hate to say it, look at Liverpool, something like that. They, they're always interchanging with, with who they have in their, in their front three or front four. And I just don't think Dice probably does it enough, like even switching McNeil and Njai for like 10, 15 minutes in a game, putting McNeil back on the left or putting Jack Harrison on the left and McNeil on the right. They're all very, um, they're all very, they're all, all them players I've just mentioned are, are all quite comfortable in all three of those roles um, or even going to a 4 4 2 at times and in certain games where you put Njai next to Dom for the, for the knockdowns because. I think, like Paul said, that the gap between the midfield and the striker it, it is really worrying at times for me because, and it may, and we've just been talking before you can't I actually thought Dominic didn't have a great game on Saturday, but 
But is that just down to the structure of the team? Why he's not having a good game? Because he's not getting enough bodies around him. Like Paul said before we come on, he, he won a lot of headers in the first half, but nobody was around him. That's not Dominic's fault. That's a structure issue. That's is Dwight, is Dwight McNeil too far back becoming like a defender, like a defensive midfield rather than his job of being a number ten. So I think there are questions that they they stuff that Sean Dyche and the coaching team need to sort out because I think I said it in the Leicester game. The last fifteen minutes, the midfield is way too deep from Dom. Where first half, it was very close to Dom, and we got a lot, a lot of opportunities. So, um, I think Dice, I think he does need to look at that side of it. Whether Dwight McNeil is the long term answer, I think if you look at the stats, and I've seen a few things over the weekend, that Dwight McNeil, even though he's doing an okay job structurally, probably isn't the best option in that number ten role. Mm. But he's delivering, isn't he, in terms of goals and assists? That's 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 what we're saying. It's, it's what yeah. we're saying about Decore. The, the, the stats about Decore don't lie as well when he's no. in the team. Everton don't lose. Mm. So, Paul, what are your what are your thoughts on Everton's structure? Then that midfield three is so obviously the two central midfielders, the one in that number ten role. You know, I think we can all probably say the structure doesn't feel right, does it? In terms, of, especially when we're off the ball, when we haven't got the ball defensively, it is a little bit susceptible. And, and Steve, as he says, he's absolutely right. You know, teams are bypassing our midfield far, far too easy. And there was a couple of times in the second half where Everton pinch up a little bit and they're running at our back four very, very quickly. And again, I think if Newcastle had a bit more of a cutting edge about them, just like Crystal Palace, to be fair, in the first half the other week, I think Everton would have would have found themselves in you know in real, real trouble. What, what do you make of it? I mean, I, I, I don't think Sean Dutch knows his, his best two central midfielders. I don't think he knows. I think at the moment he's obviously settled on Dwight McNeil being in that 10 role simply because he's delivering in terms of goals and assists. I think he's settled on his wingers and enjoys one. And I think we can all probably agree eight, nine times out of ten, it's going to be Jack Harrison just due to his work ethic. And he can he can trust him defensively. But it's that midfield too, isn't it? How do you feel about it at the moment? I don't think we know what, what the best midfield two is either. I don't think nobody knows. I think when Idrissa came on, apart from that sitter, I thought he was excellent off the ball. His demand to recoveries, his, his pressing... His interceptions, I think, all the dirty work that Idris Aganaga is always being good at. He had a really good game on Saturday. Then it's on the ball when he's a bit, when he struggles more. Although he kept it really simple the weekend again, apart from that chance. As I said before, I, I I've said numerous times I don't like the balance and the structure of the team with Dwight in the ten. For me, he's a wide midfielder who's got a lovely left foot to cross to cross the ball, and he and he's got a lovely shot on him. I like said before. I'm just going to sound like a broken record. I like my number ten to be able to go both ways. Mm. I like my number ten to be able to be unpredictable. I think the problem with Dwight at times, although he is delivering in terms of goals and and his assists, again that's due to the technical ability that he has, which is which is massive. I think we become too predictable going forward, and I don't think we're. Um, I don't think the shape is good enough defensively off the ball with him in the 10 because he's not a number 10. I don't care what. I know people have said for a while Dwight is a good, good number 10. He's always played in the... He's always been a winger, winger. really. Yeah. Play either left or right for Burnley and he's been a winger. Would you share the same agreement though that Everton don't really have a natural winger in the whole team? And Jai, I think, we'd, I think we'd all agree, probably he wants, to play, well, he wants to play as a number 10. Jack Harrison sees himself a better as a 10. And McNeil sees himself better as a 10. Uh, and Lindstrom does see himself better as a 10. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he does. And I think that's where you, that's where the problem is. Yeah, and I think it goes back to deadline day when when we were fuming that we never got a winger over the line. It's been a issue at the club for a number of seasons and mm -hmm. it has been addressed. And I think that's the biggest issue I had with, with Kevin Thelwell, which we discussed last week. The, the failure to bring in an actual PC tricky winger. So now you've got to put players that don't really want to play on the wing, on the wing. Mm. And, and, and centrally, they love Timur Obunum. You know, we talk about the, the midfield two now. They love Timur Obunum, but they're not loving him off the ball. They think, you know, obviously needs to be worked yeah. on. And that's fair, he needs to be developed. You know, that, that, that's a different part of the game entirely that you have to learn. You know, where to be, where not to be, when to press, when not to press, when to pinch. Do you get touch tight? Do you back off? And that, and that takes time, that's experience. Adrissa Garnage doesn't really want to sit. He also wants to press high. He wants to pinch the ball. Decore isn't really a deep line midfielder, if we're all honest, because I don't think off, I think on the ball he's not good enough to play no. that role to the starters. I think Mangala's probably the best of that bunch to play that deep role. But then you have James Garner as well, who who's probably our best natural central midfielder as a footballer in terms of getting on the ball. I think he's probably the best. He's crossing the first half Very good. for Decore. It's a fantastic cross. I mean, it's a wonder cross. 
what would your midfield two be? Because at the moment, again, I, I agree with what, you're, what you pair are saying. I don't think the gaffer at the moment is settled. At the moment, he's settled with the core and Mangala because we've gone five points in the last three games and we're unbeaten in three. But I don't think anyone really knows the best three. Uh, yeah, the, the answer to that is... I think with Sean Dyche is that... I don't think James Garner's probably suited to a midfield two for Sean Dyche mm. because of the way he wants to play. I've said this a few times. I actually think James Garner, with a manager who's a bit more progressive, wants to play a certain style of play, is a very good midfielder in, in the sixth role. But I think he's a bit of a waste, really, if he's if the ball's keep going to keep going over his head, which, let's be honest, that, that is that, that is a tactic that we do play with. We do bypass the six as, as a team. We don't really play through the middle of the park. It's kind of like get it out wide, get the ball in the box, and, and that's it. That's why I don't think, and I don't, I don't know, but I don't know what you like to what think of this, but I actually don't think we'll probably ever see the best of him and GI because of that. I think we're seeing, I think, I think, we're, I think we're seeing a good side of him right now, but we're only seeing spells of it because he's playing it like Paul said there. He's playing out wide, where I do think is that actual. I think the best of him you'll get is in the middle of the park, it, it, especially in that ten roll, because he's tricky. He's neat. And he's really neat. He's, he, he he finds pockets where. I think off the left, he's having to do so much work going forward. You're losing the, the talent you can get going the other way. Mm, um, defensively, def you mean. Yeah, yeah, defensively. Yeah. He's great defensively. He really is. Works like, very he hard. Works really too. hard. But I do think you the, the, the amount of work he does that way, you lose the going that way. With I the think he'd benefit with a different fullback behind him. Potentially, yeah. Yeah. Like, so not going to overlap. Overlap, yeah. yeah. We, we, I said to you in the Palace game, the amount of times he'd come inside and there was so much space on the left mm. and... And our left back was on the halfway line. That's just yeah. You, you can't have that. And obviously, like I said, not against Ashley Young because I thought Ashley Young was very good. And so that he's a thirty-nine-year-old left back, right back, right winger, left winger. Yeah, yeah. Um, he, he's not left foot. He's not. That's not his 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 role. The reality is, if you had someone like Luca Dean who's doing amazing at Villa now, he'd be the perfect type of type of player to go with in Jai as well because he's very Pinar Bainesy. Mm. And um, Jack Harrison feels the same. He 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 feels the same with different fullbacks. Yeah. It would then help his game. He always feels when he gets the ball, it's always square, and then he has to go back because he's not a natural winger. He's not going to be able to beat a man very easy. He doesn't have blistering pace. He then has no one overlap him to give him then that bit of space to go into. So it's either a one on one where I may lose the ball because I'm not particularly quick and I'm not an out and out winger, or I have to check back and yeah. go back inside. And that's what they end up doing a lot. And McNeil does that a lot when he's a winger as well. He checks back goes and that. goes back to the fullback. Yeah, yeah, he goes back because yeah. there's no overlap, and because there's no overlap. There's then no space created. Now I know our, I know our wingers, you know, or maybe in the no wingers, whatever whatever you want to call it, they are frustrated by that. Yeah, because if you look, our wingers shouldn't be picking the ball up on the halfway line. No, they should be picking the ball. I'd say 10, 15 yards. I'd say another ten yards. Up. Yeah, the, the, that, and that's where that's when you're relying on your overlapping fullback. Mm. I think in Jai's having to carry the ball so much. Yes. From deep, because we're playing that type of we're not having much of the ball. That's another reason, and and, and and I'm not I'm not comparing any of them to Leighton Baines because it's not fair. No. But when you look at Leighton Baines and Pienaar and that partnership, every time Pienaar got the ball, Leighton Baines was on his bike, yeah, and then that created space. And Moyes used to say it, we used to win games because Baines would go on the overlap, the fullback would then track Baines, Pienaar could then ghost him with the ball, and he's got ten yards to move into. Yeah, the, the reality is when we play teams, teams aren't worried about our fullbacks. Correct. Yeah. That, that that that's an issue, that's really. An issue. Never mind. Um, sorry, P and R and Dean, Baines because they were very yeah. good. Mm. Look at Dean and Bernard. Yeah, they yeah, had, they yeah, had yeah. a perfect understanding yeah, of each yeah, other. Sound. Yeah. yeah, it was sound. And when when Dean ran into the space, kind of done the overlap and ran deep. Mm. You take the full back with you, and Bernard's got space to then maybe pull it back in or. Yeah. But obviously they weren't the level of uh, Stephen P and R and Leighton Baines. That example stands. Yeah. But it's partnerships. It's it's understanding. You see it all over and that's something that we really struggle with our full backs our full backs are so important in the modern game you see it again you see it over the park how important the full backs are for them one of them is probably going to be top top assistant in the Premier League for yeah. another, for another you, season yeah. it's it's how important full backs are and although the last few years you're seeing the big teams go a bit more defensive in full backs the likes of Arsenal and City look at the amount of of times Ben White joins the attack. Look at his, look at his yeah, understanding with Bakaya Saka. Yeah, it's constant. His understanding with Bakaya Saka is unbelievable. Calafiori starts and to get mm -hmm. a bit of that with Martin. And you saw you saw the goal at the goal at City that he mm -hmm. scored from from range. 
it's just sometimes you're not even asking for that. Sometimes you're just offering just to give me space by giving yeah. me an overlap and so dragging someone with you. You're just taking a runner with you. You're just yes. taking the, the, the full back with you and just creating space. Mm. It's simple stuff that we can't do, unfortunately. Maybe yeah. when Patson's back, if he gets a chance, someone mm. that can maybe he's got a bit more energy and a bit. Well, more. he's now back, yeah. Yeah, someone that can maybe mm. run a bit past your past your winger. Maybe we may see a bit more of that, but if the structure the, allows again, it again. But the way we play may not allow that. It's mm. argu arguably saying now the full back area is probably one of your most important positions on the pitch. I think it's probably it, one of our weakest, is it? Yeah, and that's what I mean. Yeah. What's something it's with you and I, Emery says, uh, like his full backs are their most important play to the structure they, they want to play mm. because it basically the players who are coming inside gives the, the chance for the, over, the overlap of the full backs and mm. creates space. The amount of space I see, which we don't get into because we haven't got those attacking full backs. And like I said, you, you notice, and I noticed against Palace, Palace were leaving two or three players on the halfway line because they were so comfortable enough to do it because yeah, they yeah. knew nobody else would track them. Mm. So, Finally, before we wrap up, uh, Michael Keane, quick discussion about him. I thought he was excellent against Newcastle guys and he comes under a lot of scrutiny, doesn't he, Michael Keane? And, and sometimes it's fair, sometimes it's probably a little bit of a scapegoat, but Paul, I, I, I don't think he put a foot wrong, mate. I thought he was excellent. I'll be honest, I thought he was better than Tarkowski. Yeah, he was excellent. Fair play to him. Came in from, from obviously not playing last week. Yeah. With a Jared's got a quad, with a, yeah. With a new Jared injury, which obviously is a bit of a downer for everyone. Yeah. And uh, people are already thinking, oh, Keane's back in. How's this gonna go? Stood up to the challenge. He was excellent, dominant in the box. He didn't put a single foot wrong. And as you said, there was his, it was his a uh, colleague at centre half, James Sarkowski, gave the penalty away. So Michael Michael Keane had a. Had an excellent game. Mm. Steve, you happy with Michael Keane's performance? Yeah, same. I actually don't think he's done much wrong this season mm. than he's played. I do think James Tarkovsky is the one who's been probably letting the defence side of it down. I thought, like you said there, I thought he was he was a lot better than Tarkovsky on, on Saturday. I actually think his his actual general passing goes up quite he's quite underrated as well. Yeah. He's, he's very good at getting his the diags, ball. Yeah, the diags from out yeah. wide. It was some really good balls to Jack Harrison, especially in the uh, in the first half, but he is what he is, Michael Keane. He's always going to divide divide fans. I think at the moment, I think uh, I think people need to realise that probably Jake O'Brien isn't ready for for Premier League action. Even though we bought him for a lot of money, but let's be honest, it was a very small down payment which we got him for. Um, I just think Sean Dice trusts him. Sean Dice knows he can come in and do a job. He seems a really good lad around the place as well, from what I've seen and what I've heard about him. He's uh, he, he he always comes in and does a job. He's not one of those players who he, he, he throws the towel in when he comes in. He, I don't think is he Everton's long term answer. No, he definitely isn't. But <clears throat> is he okay to come in and do a job for Everton? I I, I don't think there's any issues with that. I think he's done okay this season. I do get the I, I do get the point of view of fans saying it. Oh, it makes the whole team nervous. But I I disagree with that. I just think I just think. He does get a bit. He does get labelled a bit of a scapegoat at times. But if you actually look at his overall performances, they're not always as bad as I think people make out. Mm. Well, finally, this is one. It will be before we we uh, wrap up. Um, a lot of talk over a, a certain tweet by Everton Football Club regarding Anthony Gordon's penalty miss. Uh, it's been you know a hot topic on social media, guys. Uh, you know Everton's uh, former medical staff Dan Donachy uh, Dan Donachy spoke about it. James Carragher has had his say on it as well. <laughs> What do you pair think of the tweet? If those that haven't seen it, it's obviously Anthony Gordon missing the penalty, and it's the the, the, uh, the is it the family fortunes noise yeah. that uh, yeah. uh, Simon Jordan Pickford, which was play, which, which for context was played at half time on the crossbar challenge. Yeah, well, it's you know it's sparked a debate, hasn't it? About you know James Jamie Carragher spoke about you know you shouldn't do this to a former graduate who earned you a lot of money. Um, you know, it's, <laughs> former employees brought up mental health. Some people are saying, come on, it's a bit of fun. Where do you pair see this? Paul, I'll start with you, mate. There was not one single mention of it when it happened last week to Mark A. It's only going to Tatney Gordon and he used to play for Everton. That's the only reason why people are acting like, like they care, let's be honest. If <clears throat> Jamie Carragher can say what he wants, Dan Donachie is clearly not reading the room. Fact of the matter is, Andy Gordon threw his toys out the pram six months before he left, wanted to go Chelsea. Didn't want to travel to West Ham for what was Lampard's last game in charge when he needed him the most. Didn't turn up to training three days before he went to Newcastle. 
Then first time he came to Goodison, he was celebrating in the um, just outside the dressing room, like giving it large after he came on for about five minutes. Which I have no issue with him doing that. I've by got the no way. issue with it. Him doing that. Because he's a Newcastle he, player, and he, exactly, yeah, you, yeah. you give it, you, you take some yeah, back. It's just, exactly. it is football. It's just football. It's the same way that they Newcastle fans give a lot of talk. Pickford, Pickford he yeah. gives it back, and it, it's all just, it's all just football. You can say, oh, but it's not the official club account tweeting it. It's a joke. Get over it. It's a joke. He missed the penalty. If he scored, either shush the Gladys streets and either being fuming at the time, but I wouldn't have had the problem with it because if, you, if you're giving it, you've got to take it. It just goes both ways. Stay. Yeah, I just think it's a bit of a non-story. It's 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 a tweet. It's mm. a tweet that the club have put out. Obviously, people haven't been happy with it. I, I, yeah, it, it, I'll be honest with you. I think it's just a... It's a it's, it, he missed the penalty. We were all made up. He missed the penalty. He was he was giving a bit to Everton fans during the game, shaking his head when they were singing red and white shite and all that type of stuff. So mm. I think it is what it is. It's it's the it's the social media world now, isn't it? That I think we all live in where if you're gonna if you're gonna every camera's on you now to see what you like and obviously I, I I'm not really aware of obviously anything obviously I know about the, obviously the West Ham stuff and travelling down and not and not wanting to play and stuff like that, but um I'm sure there's always two sides to every story, but he, he hasn't helped himself as well. Over yeah. the last couple of years, I don't think he's helped himself with comments he's made about <clears throat> obviously who he supports and all who his heroes are and all that type of stuff. Since he's, he hasn't really said anything about Everton, but then his argument could be <clears throat> Everton didn't really say anything to him when he left. So yeah. I think they're both. Still I couldn't get you know what I, I'll be honest with you. I couldn't care less about him. I, 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 he's one of them players I don't even think about. He was an Everton player. Yeah, yeah. He's got. He, he's not an Everton player anymore to me. No. So I don't really care well, about. He's him. not an Everton player. Full stop. So well, that's that's it. he's not an Everton player. So I don't really care about him. Yeah. As I say, so, no, but no, nobody mentioned anything <coughs> at all last week when the Everton, when the when the Everton TikTok account put a little bit of a of a funny video about Mark Gay when he celebrates mm. his goal and then yeah. obviously he had a little bit of a go back. It it just happens on on uh, yeah, on club media. TikToks and kind of. Mm. Club accounts, it just happens everywhere. It just it is just people sticking up for for for, for Gordon, which himself he, he didn't even say nothing himself. It's no. not like he's he's mentioned this and he's gone about it. If you asked him, he'd probably say, Yeah, well, I gave it a bit, they gave it back. It's one of them, it's banter. Mm. He he thought he was he stepped up to take the penalty. Yeah. He thought this is my moment, I'll have it, he says. Well, Pickford will have it too. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> And there we go, guys. That is all the latest news coming out of Goodison Park and Finch Farm. Thank you for joining us as always. We've got a very, very special guest on this week, so stay tuned. And we'll be back shortly. Take care and all the very best. Goodbye.